What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. Gonna be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I'm joined today with Zasha. How are you doing today, Zasha? Hello, everybody. <laughs> awesome. I'm really glad you're here, but I got to admit, I'm even happier that my very favorite audience member has joined me today. And why is my very favorite audience member here today, Zasha? It's because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate, syndicators, investors, buyers, sellers, all those types of people. And why do I do that? Well, part of it is for compliance, but really you need to know the other uh -huh. people who are in the industry. Where's the overlap? Is there a chance for us to do business? And it's super duper important because if we want to share our private deals with each other, we have to have a substantive relationship. But before we get too excited with that stuff, is Hasha, do you want to uh, introduce yourself a bit for the audience? Of course. Hello, everybody. My name is Zasha Smith. I am a full-time investor here on Maui in Hawaii. I was a civil engineer for 10 years prior to this. I am still a licensed professional engineer, so I can still stamp plans, and I still do drop my own plans when I do new builds. Um, I have been investing for three years now into real estate, I started in 2019 and bought my first rental and first flip. I netted 100K on my first flip. I was only making 70K at that time as a licensed engineer stamping plans for shopping centers, hotels, uh, residential subdivisions. So I threw it to the wind, went all into real estate um, a few months later and haven't looked back. Now I own 10 rental properties here on Maui and Hawaii, mostly long term. Um, and I rent to people on Section 8 or um, that have uh, rental assistance because I came from low income housing and was raised there and uh, was raised by a single mom. So I believe that's a way you can give back as well as being an investor. And I have one short term um, Airbnb. However, the regulations are super strict here and um, they're getting, you know, they're really cracking down. So now I started shifting into investing into syndications and larger projects because um, one, I'm still flipping to this day. So I need the depreciation for my active income. But two, I haven't been able to find any um, real good deals here since it is so expensive that now I'm kind of shifting my focus to um, bigger syndications for write-offs. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> My next thing for you, though, it's a little bit unusual. If I go like this one, though, then uh, there it is. But wait, check your eight. Uh, if you check in your eight, maybe just below your camera over, over here, it's look for the audience is down here. There might be this big. Can you see if there's a big, ugly red subscribe button? Because they really should have the gray subscribe button i i and now uh, anyway jokes aside i go through the five distinct motivations first when i go through these chance encounters the very first motivation i found among commercial real estate investors is to preserve their purchasing power and what's that all about it means if you have a big enough nest egg you've got a portfolio of assets and you use the cash flow the profits that come from them to make ends meet then this is you and the reason why people make their next acquisition is because of inflation or asset cra uh, crashes so they borrow using their current portfolio as collateral that's not what i'm up to what i'm up to it sounds very similar to zasha's situation my background is in technology i've owned a crm agency since 2011 because i used to work for web.com but one of the problems of being a high wage or salary earner is you're paying more in tax than anybody else so it hit me it's like well why don't i pivot to something where i'm getting rewarded in the form of deployed equity instead of in cash income so that's why i'm doing all of this stuff but a lot of people they are attracted to commercial real estate because they're trying to fast track their retirement or more specifically take control over their own schedule you know some people they want to work fewer months per year some people want to work fewer weeks per month but uh regardless that's what 
these people are up to. And it's a little bit different from the next two groups. Like, for example, the ambitious ones who want to buy their entire hometown, they are in it for the generational wealth. They want to make sure that their great-grandchildren never have to hold a day job. As a result, they're going to be hustling into their 90s. So they're great people to have on your team. Just like the last group, they're going to keep on hustling to their 90s as well. But what makes them different is they found a sector of society, or maybe it's animals, maybe it's the environment. Regardless of what it is, they realize that you need a substantial nest egg if you're going to make a really big impact on that sector of society. So of those five different uh, motivations, Zasha, what combination of them would you say describes you best? I would say, um, I mean, we're always looking for ways to make more money passively. So that essentially, I mean, we always want to not defer taxes, but we want to make sure that we're getting enough of that income that we're working so hard for back to us prior to it going out. And I know that sounds kind of silly and I'm not the best person to describe things. I'm all, all not that articulate, but uh, I think I owe my success to just being surrounded by people like you, people who have done it before, seeing their ways and kind of just emulating them and follow, following their guidance. Of course, everybody's journeys is different, but honestly, like my why is so that I can have more time with my family, however that looks like passively. And um, honestly, these bigger syndications, I've, I've, I mean, I'm a fix and flipper. So it is a very active business and I'm trying to pull myself out of that. So one is more time, one is keeping more of that money so that you can deploy it into other wealth building strategies and also give back to other people. So whether that's, you know, it'll save you in taxes if you invest in a charity, right? It's still going to a good cause, but now you have the choice on where that money goes instead of kind of just giving it all away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. It brings me to the next question though, which is the tolerance for risk assessment. And the question is, please fill in this blank. There are many popular investment asset classes, but I think blank is too risky. What's too risky for you, Zasha? Definitely the metaverse. I think that's a lot. I mean, if, if that topic came up, like, remember, like, the beginning of this year, I think everybody was, oh, the metaverse is going to be the new thing. You got to buy this online real estate. But honestly, I mean, the noise died down, the fad kind of went away. And so, yeah, that's something that I think is too risky, just because I like to touch, feel and see things. And that to me was so out of the realm of my understanding that it seems too risky right now for me. Mm -hmm. I love that. And uh, especially because I totally called it back years ago. Uh, I was into the into virtual reality back in the 90s in its first generation. But I also uh, I pre ordered my VR set back in was that uh, 2016, I think the room scale one came out. And I showed it to enough people and like people don't make VR a habit, you know, having something stuck on your face all the time is not great, but uh, that's a digital kind of real estate. Let's talk about physical kinds of real estate and to do that and make sure that you can effectively communicate on the subject of commercial real estate. You can go to dandoesdeals.com and get your dandoesdeals.com commercial roll die with the six major rules in a commercial deal. And because I'm a dummy, I don't even ask for your email address that's like the worst thing you can do as a marketer is not ask for contact information in return for it but I want you to print this out so you can show it to your friends and family and I go through this die in every episode of chance encounters to make sure that you know how these deals work and how my guest fits into these deals so let's go through these real quick first one the repositioner looks at a bunch of different properties because they're acquisitions people they're doing this paperwork what are they doing with this paperwork well there's a fan Fancy word for it. It's underwriting. That means they're doing the math. They're finding out, first of all, is this property even actually making the amount of money that the broker and seller claim it is? But on top of that, not everybody uses the term repositioner, but to reposition the property means to find ways where there's some upside. So that's why this person earns their seat at the table. Now there are three main tools in their tool belt that they have to find upside. If the repositioner has great financier relationships, financiers being people who deal only with paper and money, okay, if they have great financier relationships, maybe they can get more advantageous lending. 
There's some upside baked in just right there, but let's assume that that's not available. So the first place that our typical repositioner is going to look is the operations. Make those operations a little bit more efficient. Get fewer of these Benjamins going down that toilet. But of course, there's more than just unclogging toilets and taking rents in and mowing lawns and taking out trash. Operations also includes a marketing component, specifically when it comes to vacancy. And that is one of my fortes is the marketing side and of course the digital systems. But if your vacancy rate is lower, then you've, uh, you're, you've got more upside right there. But very frequently because commercial real estate is so competitive, operations isn't going to be enough. So the repositioner will often get a contractor team to do a value add. In other words, they'll renovate the units to make them nicer. And then that way the next tenant will be happy to pay more in rent than the previous one. But contracting is very, very expensive. So if the repositioner has the same problem I do, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm from the internet. And so because of that, I need a local. I need boots on the ground, somebody who can be there in an hour or so, because that's sure not going to be me. I'd be stuck at the airport in an hour. But if this is your ownership team and the repositioner turns around to the financier and says, hey, I got a property. It's worth tens of millions of dollars that I really, really want to buy. So do you happen to have, say, tens of millions of dollars that you want to lend me? Well, the financier is going to be like, well, there's one thing you haven't mentioned yet, which is who's your sponsor, KP? What's that all about, you say? Well, some coaching programs gloss over this part, but in order to be eligible for a commercial loan, somebody in the fold has to already own a similar asset. Okay, so if you're looking at 350 unit apartment complexes, you're going to need somebody who already owns a 350 unit apartment complex. But on top of that, you need a certain amount of liquidity. And then between the ownership team, you need a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan. But if you got all those pieces, you've got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Zasha, as far as your core competencies that you're most likely to contribute to your next deal, uh, where, what combination, what sides of that die uh, do you bring? So typically um, in my shorter term flip projects, I'm usually the, uh, I guess you would say project manager. I'm not really the local person um, and financier, maybe project manager, financier, um, underwriter. Because uh, typically when people come to me, they already have a deal, they've underwritten. I just verify um, what they've underwritten with my uh, own standards. And then uh, usually I'm in charge of the escrow process, um, finding the financing or qualifying, right? So I have the kind of net worth in order to qualify for different types of loans or I've signed on loans before that um, will help us qualify. And then I'm able to raise either private money or um, help to bring on limited partners to syndications to also raise the capital. So that's where I'm finding my kind of niche. But and then since I already was a civil engineer for 10 years, I already have experience dealing with contractors and projects that I know kind of the sequence of it. So I can oversee that portion as well. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. So let's talk about the ideal property then. And when commercial syndicators are talking to each other about a buy box or an ideal property, they're really talking about three things. The first one is geography. Which dates, which counties, possibly even which neighborhood that's going to matter. The second thing is going to be the size. Now we're talking about multifamily here. So unit count is what they end up using. And the idea is that if somebody's going after a 15 year unit property, they're probably not going for a 500 unit property at the same time. It's just too different. So the size is going to matter if it's other forms of commercial real estate, like uh, industrial, it'll be square footage. But the third one, it uses one word for two different things, which is something I kind of hate. And the word is class. The first definition of the mean of uh, the word class means the condition of the building. So is it old? Is it beat up? Is it up to date? Is it lavish? Okay, that's one meaning of class. Now, the second meaning of class has to do with where the property is located. And so that'll be like, how are the schools in that area? What's the crime rate like in that area? And both of those meanings of class are rated with the same system as grade school. So it's like A plus, A minus, B plus, C, and so on. So uh, Zasha, as far as deals that are easier to say yes to and more difficult to say no to, what should what should somebody bring you? 
definitely something that's located in one of the warmer states, I would say, that is very active or like emerging cities in around those. Um, so something in like Austin, Texas or Houston, um, San Antonio, um, and then Florida as well. So um, there's parts of Florida. Asala is like where we've been kind of targeting. Um, and uh, the size probably, you know, it depends if you want to JV. So there's two, there's different ways to go about commercial real estate, right? You could just JV depending on um, if it's a seller finance deal and you only need so much money, but you need somebody with experience as well. Um, there's opportunities just to have like a few partners. So that is all dependent on um, the size, but you know, anywhere from 50 to 100 units is something that I'm looking for. And then also a 10% um, cash and cash return or like a 10% cap rate. But I know there's so much different ways to get creative. So um, I don't like to be too kind of niche down on those numbers. It all depends on how much money we got to bring to the deal as well. And then what it's performing at, because if something that has to be stabilized, you have to put in all this work versus something that's already kind of stabilized, but you can make little tweaks, you know, as far as like raising the rents to help with the numbers or something like that, that's simple. I mean, I'm open to easier deals like that as well that don't need to be so much value add. And then you talked about um, neighborhoods. So Around a B class would be, you know, ideal. Um, it's not, you know, A or C. You're kind of right in the middle, <laughs> lingering right there. Um, but yeah, that that would be my kind of like buy box. Okay, beautiful. And then as far as people go, uh, I always like to point out to the audience that uh, my favorite part of commercial real estate is because you've got these multiple lanes, people are so helpful and eager to give referrals because everybody's building all these different teams. But even though that's the case, we've all got our own unique skill sets. So we're going to be disproportionately well suited to helping some sides of the die than others. Me personally, because of my CRM, digital marketing background, all that kind of fun stuff, the sponsor KPs are the people who I am most often looking for just because they've already got the foundation where what I can provide makes a real difference. Whereas when you're first starting off as a repositioner, people are generally looking for grunts who can do 120 hour weeks, something like that. So uh, that's who I'm looking for. And Zasha, I don't know if you have any 506B deals going on. If you do, don't be enticing investors because they don't like that. But uh, as far as like, I know you can still say big beginners as well, but uh, who are you disproportionately suited to help uh, in commercial real estate? So I want to get to, uh, especially because like how you said, if the sponsors are KPs, I want to help the GPs, you know, find whatever it is that they need. And I mean, I'm a newbie in this space. I just started getting involved in syndications in, in January, but We've we've done a few deals and I've been a part GP, so I've I've kind of seen the behind the scenes of the inner workings of it, but I haven't uh, taken on that responsibility fully. So I believe, I mean, I still believe in doing the grunt work or whatever needs to be done, so that I get the experience and be around these GPs, find find out how they find deals and how I can help them find deals or help them, you know, find the capital. So wherever I fit in, I feel like I'm super flexible with that and. Being that I still am active in these other types of real estate with flips and then RV parks and just doing a bunch of things. However, I can connect them to whatever they need is kind of where I'm rolling the dice. <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. And uh, we met uh, through uh, through a Zoom meetup and LinkedIn is a great way to reach me, especially because I got a unique name. Uh, how about you? Like, uh, is, it, is there a website that's the best way? Like, what's the best way to reach out to you or which social media platform should people try and connect with you on? Um, so I'm on uh, ZashaSmith.com is my website has all about me. I was just on um, Bigger Pockets as well. So my episode is there kind of gives a, a resume or little kind of background on um, what I've done so far. Uh, Instagram has been my biggest way to connect with people and especially, you know, people bring me deals on there or want to invest money and start the relationship there. So that's been huge at invest with Zasha. And then also LinkedIn, um, Zasha Smith is what I'm under. I found that that helps connect me to people like you, like Dan and um, other higher, higher end, I guess, more experienced commercial 
real estate investors. And so if you're just depends on the type of person that you're kind of looking to connect with, but definitely just putting yourself out there attending zooms, I just met Dan and a whole bunch of other people that I've never seen before, they never seen me. So when you're trying to level up or get into something new into a new space, you know, find those experienced people hop on these free zooms. I mean, you don't got to go anywhere, you just turn on your computer, make those relationships connections, and then you can go from there, see what they do and see where you can fit in to help. I love it. I love it. And there's only one other thing. It's more of a suggestion. It's not for you, Zasha. It's like, just so you, in case you have, if you've noticed like uh, migraine like symptoms, you know, like pain searing in your eyes and like, ah, it's probably, it might be the red subscribe button. It's, it's the, like, if somebody walks by your screen and sees that awful red button, what are they going to think about you? you? You know, it's free, right? You just hit the thing and then it, like, it doesn't cost you anything. Oh, okay. I'm biased. The reason is because if enough people hit the button, then YouTube will start to pay for these videos instead of me. So that's what I really want. But of course, all jokes aside, it doesn't cost you anything. All it means is that these videos might show up in your list of suggestions. You can go ahead and ignore those because I just appreciate the fact that you spent this time with me. Just like Zasha, I appreciate appreciate uh, that you joined me and I got to know you a little bit better. This has been really awesome. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Make sure you 506 B me. Any syndicators, make sure you 506 B me. Hi. Oh, hey, yeah, here's my code. You got your QR code scanner. Okay, yeah, oh yeah, just hold it right in the square there. Okay, cool, and now you hit open in browser. Okay. Okay, are you already logged into 506 B me? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so there's my video. So now I'm already on your watch list. So when you get back to your hotel, you can find out what my core competencies are and my level of sophistication. Sound good? Yeah. I love your hat. Real estate's a scam. That's really funny. Yeah, that's funny. Nice meeting you. You too. 506 B me, everybody.